Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everybody. I heard a lot of people singing behind me, and you know, I'm hard of hearing. I think I y'all like some of them songs we were doing this morning. Well, let's open up in a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here in your house this morning to hear the message that you would have for us. Lord, as we listen to the radio, as we watch the television and talk around the water cooler at work, Lord, it just seems like there are so, so many things taking place in this world that we have a lot of questions about. But Lord, I just, I thank you that we can remember that you are in control. And as we learned in Sunday school this morning, that there is absolutely no reason for the believer to be anxious about anything. Pray we can keep that in mind, Lord, as, just as we leave here. As always, we pray for your guidance and your direction. In Jesus' name, amen. So guys, we're going to be covering a lot of ground this morning. Covering a lot of ground today. And, and we're going to be going through, of course, last week we started in Jude's letter. And we just looked at the first several verses there. But we're going to be covering a lot more ground today. And, and we're going to be going through the body and on into the conclusion of the letter of Jude. And we could spend a significant amount of time in the book of Jude. It's only 25 verses long. And we could spend a significant amount of time there. Because we're going to see that Jude uses a lot of different illustrations. And after... Prayerful consideration, I chose to go ahead and let's go through the body of this letter and on to, into the conclusion. And, and I chose that for several reasons. One is each illustration that Jude uses is a mountain of information. It really is. But we would end up, if we talked about each different illustration that Jude uses at length, we're going to end up not in the book of Jude. We're going to end up in another book of the Bible. And we're going to spend a lot of time there. And, and we would end up, you know, our focus would be being taken away from what Jude is sharing in this letter. So instead of going in depth on a lot of these illustrations, we're going to tie, kind, of, kind of skip across the top of those mountains, so to speak, uh, today. And... You know, we know that, that Second Peter has a lot of parallels with Jude. So if you're here on Wednesday nights, you're going to be getting some additional uh, information that Jude is sharing with us uh, from Second Peter there. So, and another reason is I hope and I pray that some of those mountains that we skip over the top of today from these illustrations and this information that Jude shares with us, I hope that it piques your interest. Because I'll, I'll tell you guys, we can spend a lot of time here in church learning from God's Word, but it doesn't make up for when you're in your own personal Bible study. So I hope that some of these illustrations just pique your interest and go, I sure wish he'd have talked about that a little more. Well, I hope you dive into it in your personal Bible study. So we're going we're gonna to be going through a lot of the rest of, of Jude today. So we began uh, diving into the letter of Jude last week and we learned that he originally began writing to believers about their common salvation. But he ultimately didn't finish out that whole letter that way, did he? Why? Because the Holy Spirit said, we're not going to write about that. I want you to write. I want you to write and encourage these people that you're writing to and encourage them to contend earnestly for the faith against these bogus believers that we learned about last week who can wreak havoc in the church. 
the false doc doctrines that they can bring is that it can just wreak havoc. And we learn that contending for the faith is a battle. Contending for the faith is a battle. It's a battle to keep sound teaching of the truth of God's word. The truth of his word is what the believer lives their lives by. Are you hearing me? The truth of God's word is what the believer is to live their life by. Let's shrink that down to two words. Biblical worldview. That's what we're supposed to have is a biblical worldview. When we walk out of the doors and we go home and we live our life over the next week before we meet again on Sunday as a group of believers, we're to be living our life through what God's Word says and how He says we should be living our life. That's a biblical worldview. Things can go quickly south. They can go south quickly if false teachings like these bogus believers were bringing into the church. So things can go south real quick. So I want to share a quote with you that I read. The past is behind. Learn from it. The present is here. Live it. The future is ahead. Prepare for it. And that's just how Jude put the body of this letter together that we're going to look at today as he shared about those, those false teachers, those bogus believers in his letter. Past, present, and future. And he gives, like I said, numerous illustrations about the past that showed the actions of these false teachers, these bogus believers. And he also shares God's judgment on those. And he gives descriptions of the present and the actions of those false teachers, those bogus believers. And he tells us to contend for the faith so that we can be prepared for the future. So we're going to be in Jude. So turn with me there. We're going to start in verse Five. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, all, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. In these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run, run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of Kor. So here, Jude is telling about the past. Look at that quote that we just, we just read. The past is behind us. We need to learn from it. So in this passage, Jude is sharing some illustrations to the people that he was addressing in this letter, and they should remember. And these stories should be familiar to us too. So the first thing he talks about is groups of people of the past. And this first group is the Israelites. And he talks about their unbelief. And this is from the book of Numbers, around chapter 14 and around chapter 32. 
when the Israelites sent spies into the land to go and check it out, if you remember that. Well, the report was that the land was occupied by a very formidable opponent. And this is what Joshua and Caleb said. They said, if the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. God delivered the Israelites out of Egypt with the intention of having them settle in the promised land, right? But that group of people did not want to proceed because of the report that they got when they sent the spies into that land. They didn't want to proceed. Because of their unbelief, God said this, the carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in the wilderness. Those very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. Except for who? Joshua and Caleb. Those people's unbelief and their lack of faith in the Lord kept them out of the promised land. That's what kept them out. It wasn't the opponents that they feared. It was their unbelief. Next thing Jude tells us about is angels. And this is about rebellion. Now, Satan convinced other angels in heaven to follow him in rebellion against God. 1 Peter 5, 8, Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We've said it before, lies and deceit, that's what he uses. And due to that rebellion and those angels following Satan in rebellion, they're destined for God's eternal judgment. Now he gets to Sodom and Gomorrah. That's in Genesis chapter 19. And it is about unrepentant, immoral behavior. Now Abraham, Abraham attempted to intercede for Sodom. And he asked God to spare the city if only ten people in that city were found to be righteous. And we've read before, we know that the lust of the flesh was rampant there. And not even ten people were found in that city to be righteous. And God rained down fire and brimstone from heaven. So that's groups of people that you used as an illustration from the past. Okay? Now he gets in and he's going to use some individuals from the past as examples. He says, likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. The people Jude's speaking of here exhibit the same actions as the illustrations that he provided. They defile the flesh, they reject authority, they speak evil of others. Now, Jude tells us about a battle, an altercation between Michael the archangel and Satan. Michael did not confront Satan. When we, we read that, or if you read it again, you'll notice that Michael does not confront Satan. What did he say? He said, the Lord rebuke you. He probably, talking about Michael, probably had a lot of not very nice things that he could have called the devil or said to him. But he did not do that. He didn't speak evil of the devil. Those false teachers, those bogus believers, they have no problem speaking evil of others. And Satan is known as a slanderer. Michael, the archangel, did just as the believers have been instructed by Jude. He contended. 
he contended with the authority of God. The Lord rebuke you. That's what he said. Now Jude tells us about Cain. Y'all might remember Cain. Be familiar with him. Genesis chapter 4. We see jealousy. We see hatred. We see works without faith. Cain provided a sacrifice as he should have, but it was not for the right reason. He was jealous that his brother's sacrifice was accepted. And that jealousy turned into hate. <laughs> then we have this guy named Balaam from Numbers, chapter 25. And if you go and you read more about him, you're going to see that he had a problem with greed. And he practiced religion for profit. He lusted after wealth. He lusted after status. Now we have Kor. Number 16. And this guy's problem was rebellion. If you go and read more about him. He rejected God's ordained leaders. He rejected leaders that God had chosen. Jude says, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally. Like brute beasts. In these things, they corrupt themselves. Those false teachers, they have clever instincts. They're not ignorant. They are smart. They have an appearance of being spiritual. But instead, they are natural, like a brute beast. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You may remember this. This is one of the supporting verses we read back in Galatians back weeks and weeks back. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Starting back in verse 12. <clears throat> These are spots on your love feasts. While they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water carried away by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever." Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which godly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking in accordance to their own lust. And they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. That is a mouthful that we're getting from Jude. So this is about the present. When Jude is writing this, he's describing how we can recognize a false teacher or a bogus believer. So the present is now. Live it. And this is about production. Okay? What these false teachers produce and what they do not produce. So here Jude gives a description. And he describes them in several ways. First way we see is, says there are spots on your love feast while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Now, spots refer to a rock or a reef that is hidden under the water. Okay? The surface of the water can look just as completely calm, and you would think that it's just going to be smooth sailing. But there can be a rock or there can be a reef just right below the water, and we can't see that danger because it looks so calm out across there. 
If a boat's traveling or a ship is going across that water and they're in the path of that rock or that reef and they hit it, that could cause a shipwreck, couldn't it? A boating accident. The love feast is a common fellowship that many churches have from time to time. You may know the exact word I'm thinking about. We might call it a potluck, right? Jude says that these false teachers, they're bold. They're without fear. They have no reverence for God. They could be at a potluck dinner near you. That's what Jude is telling us. And these are people that would love to see a shipwreck take place within the body of believers. They produce stumbling blocks because they exist to do what? Serve themselves only. That's the opposite of what we learned that a servant was last week. A servant is not self-serving, are they? Now Jude says, they are clouds without water carried away by the winds. Now there are a lot of different kinds of clouds. And we often associate clouds with rain. Clouds have different names. I looked up a few of those names. We have cirrus, stratus, cumulus, cumulonimbus, stratocumulus. I did a wonderful job pronouncing all of those cloud names. I probably need to be a weatherman. Let me give it a shot. There is a 100% chance of rain yesterday. That's going to be the best I can do. If you know what you're looking at, you can tell if it's a rain cloud or not. That it may rain on that day. Or it could just be some wispy clouds being carried across the sky with the wind. If it's a dry summer, a cloud that produces rain is very beneficial. I think we can agree on that. We live in a, in a hot part of the country. And if, it, if we're in need of rain and it rains, it's very helpful. It can water your crops. It can water your, your lawn. Rain water, when it rains, it promotes life. Keeps the danger of fire low. Jude describes these people as clouds that have no water. The doctrine that they bring, the doctrine that they spread, does not produce anything beneficial. Does it produce anything helpful? In fact, it promotes not life, but it promotes death. Eternal death. At that point, the danger of fire is certain. Jude says that they're late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. An unhealthy tree or a healthy tree that produces fruit. That's what you want, right? If a tree does not produce the fruit at the time of the year that it's supposed to, or just doesn't produce fruit at all, it's going to be looked at as an unhealthy tree. Maybe it is a dead tree because it does not produce fruit any longer. If it's dead, you may cut it down. Or you may pull it up by the roots, as we're reading here in these verses. Because it just didn't produce fruit like it was supposed to. Those false teachers produce no fruit. And they will be pulled up by the roots at God's appointed time. Now he says they're raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. If you take a trip to the beach, you may enjoy walking along the shoreline and looking for seashells in the mornings. Over the years, when my family and I have been to the beach, we gather up seashells and we, we drag them home. Typically, there's some sand mixed in there with it. But we have some vases sitting around that, of some really pretty seashells that we have found over the years from our visits to the beach. And those are, 
desirable things that are washed up from the ocean, those seashells. But after a storm, if there's big raging waves like we read here, there's probably more than seashells that have washed up if you go out that next morning and start searching. You're probably going to find lots of seaweed. You're going to find bits of driftwood and more than likely just a lot of trash that has been washed up along the beach. Those things that are washed up during a storm like that, those are undesirable. Those false teachers produce undesirable teachings. Those teachings are trash. It's seaweed. Wandering stars is the next thing. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Jude is not describing stars that we typically see when we walk outside and look up into the sky on a clear night. That's not the kind of stars that he's describing here. It's more like a shooting star. They're actually meteors. Did you know a shooting star was a meteor? And, and it's entered the Earth's atmosphere. And, and we see that shooting star come across the sky. Maybe we're driving down the road. Maybe we just happen to be looking up. And we see it shoot across the sky. And then it fades away into darkness. You just see it for, for just a minute, right? The reality is that that meteor is burning up because it has entered the Earth's atmosphere. Those false teachers, they may produce a bright light for a moment just long enough to draw attention to themselves or their teaching but they have the same fate and future as that meteor that's burned up in the night sky Jude notes that Enoch spoke about these types of people and what the Lord would do and he says this, judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way. And of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Jude says these, these false teachers, these bogus believers, they're grumblers, they're complainers. They follow their lust. They use flattery to get what they desire. Now, we don't have to go into detail about, about that right there. We know what all that stuff means, right? So we don't have to go into detail about that. But look, when you had your kids, when you were making your kids a lunch, how'd you have to make their lunch? Did... did would they eat it or would they throw a temper tantrum if you didn't make their sandwich just the right way? Mine, they had to have the crust cut off their sandwich. We had to cut it crossways so it would be four triangles. Or it just didn't taste right. And I would have a temper tantrum on my hands. Got one of those kids in here today. He probably remembers eating a whole bunch of triangle sandwiches. Those kids, they can, be, they can be complainers about stuff like that. Look, here's what Spurgeon says about grumblers and complainers. And he did a better job of explaining sandwiches than, I, than me. The bread of heaven must be cut into three pieces and served on a dainty napkin or else they cannot eat it. Talking about grumblers and complainers. Let's go back to Jude, starting in verse 17. But you, beloved, remember the words of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most high faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life, 
And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. The future is ahead. Prepare for it. And that's what Jude is sharing here. He says the apostles warned that there would be people like this. They're mockers. They cause divisions. They bring deceit. If you remember back not that long ago when we were wrapping up in Galatians, Galatians chapter 6, says this, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will reap of the flesh, will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. We have in our possession all of the information that God provided to us through the apostles and the other human writers. We have His Word. Jude is saying, guys, you've heard the apostles say that there are going to be people like I am describing you. And we've heard that as well. And we have His Word. We're told these people existed in the past. And they're in the present there when Jude is writing that letter. That's why he's writing that letter. If they were there during Jude's time, they're, they're here today as well. And they're going to be around in the future. Now Jude was going to originally write about the, the believer's common salvation. But the Holy Spirit stopped him. He said, I'm, I'm going to let you, I want you to send out this warning instead. I want you to encourage the church to contend earnestly. For what? For the faith which was once delivered to all, to the, for all to the saints. So that's what Jude is getting to now. He is telling the audience he was writing to and he's telling us how to contend for the faith. That's kind of the, the theme of this whole letter is contending for the faith. So we are to continually build. Building yourselves up on your most high faith. The education about God's Word should never stop in the life of the believer. And so many people come to saving grace, come to salvation, and they feel, that is all I need to do. I can stop right now. God wants us to grow closer to Him. Learning from God's Word does not stop in the life of the believer. You may have graduated kindergarten, you may have graduated high school. You may have graduated college. You may be retired and do all of your grocery shopping in your pajamas. But the believer never graduates from learning from God's Word. There's always more to learn. And a lot of times we need a refresher course on things, don't we? Jude says to continually pray, praying in the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 6, it says this, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all the perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, the, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of of the gospel. That's a powerful verse, guys. Look, many times we pray for convenience. We do. Lord, I pray for a good work report, a, a work evaluation today so I can be up for that raise. 
Lord, I pray that the grocery store is not out of that macaroni and cheese that I like. You know, the name brand stuff, not the generic. <laughs> Guys, the believer is indwelled by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit can help you pray. How do I know that? God's Word tells me that. Romans 8, 26, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groaning which cannot be uttered. According to Jude, we're to be in prayer about how to contend for the faith. We said last week, we learned last week that contending for the faith, it's a battle. And we're to be contenders like we're contending in an athletic competition. That we're athletic competitors to strive for victory. Pray about how you are to be a contender for the faith. Jude says we're to compassionately love on some have compassion, making a distinction. Jude says we're to have compassion on those who waver in or have doubts about their faith. This is a call to action, guys. <clears throat> those who waver in or have doubts about their faith due to a false teaching. Deal with such a situation with love. Do we need to go back to Galatians and learn how important love is to the Lord? If you find yourself in, a, in a, such a situation, deal with, with that believer with love. They need encouragement. They don't need criticism. They need to be built up with the word, not knocked down due to their doubts. Now he says we are to carefully pull, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Jude says save them with fear. We need to be careful. It's important to be careful when contending for the faith. Why? Because we could be swept away as well. He says, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. The garment of a leper was often thrown into the fire for fear of the disease that it contained. Jude says, even the garment of a sinner is defiled. He's telling us avoid contact with that sin. Even the believer cannot handle such things alone. That's why Jude urges us to continually be in the Word, to be constant in prayer, to show compassion, but be careful of the sin involved. If you're not equipped for such a battle, get equipped. Get equipped. Begin where Jude says for us to begin. Build yourself up in the Word. Be in prayer. Spiritual growth. Growing closer in your walk with the Lord does not just happen. It doesn't. No one else is responsible for your spiritual growth except for you. You can be urged to build yourself up like Jude is doing in this letter, right? But you are the one that has to take the initiative and open the pages of the Word of God. Engage the Lord in prayer. You're not going to sleep with it under your pillow at night, every night for a month, and wake up any, more, any morning for that whole month and know anything else out of God's Word. We've got to open, open up those pages. Now in this letter, Jude's given us illustrations of behavior from the past. He described the present actions. And he showed us how to deal with that in the future. These false teachers were in the past. And they were in the present when, when Jude shared this stuff, how to contend, they're going to be in the future too. So for the future, what else is going to be important 
when it comes to contending for the faith, contending for the truth that is inside the Word of God. The Great Commission. Matthew 28. This is Jesus talking. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Jude said to contend earnestly for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The gospel message was delivered to you. Can I get some head nodding? The gospel message was delivered to you. Deliver it to others. That's not a suggestion. It's a command. And it's a command from Jesus. Those false teachers, those bogus believers, their focus is on things that are temporary. Everything that we have talked about in reference to them that we learned from Jude last week and this week, those are temporary things. The believer's focus is on the eternal. And there is an importance in passing along the gospel message to the lost, to the next generation. Witness to the lost. Disciple a new believer. Go all the way back to Jude verse 1. What was Jude back in verse 1? He, was a, he is a bond servant of Christ. Witness to the lost. Disciple a new believer. Show them how to contend for the faith. Show them how to continually build their relationship with the Lord. How to continually pray. Pray in the Spirit. Compassionately love others who may be wavering in or doubting in their faith. But be careful not to fall into sin while contending for the faith. Y'all stand with me if you would. The past is behind. Learn from it. The present is here. Live it. The future is ahead. Prepare for it. That's just how Jude laid things out for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that we can take this message to heart. Lord, your word is just so rich in things that it is important for us to, to take in so we can grow closer in our walk with you. I pray that we can remember that and just dive deep into your word, hear what you would have to say to us. Lord, and, and take in those, those warnings that you place in there from time to time because those are very important as well. Lord, once again, we pray for just everything that is going on in the world today, but just remembering that you're the one that's in control, that we do not have to be anxious about those things. Pray, Lord, just guide us as we walk out these doors today and head out back into the world for the week. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.